We are currently living in the golden era of remakes, remasters, and reboots. An era where no stone is left unturned. Popular, semi-popular, and even obscure IPs are getting modern recreations faster than you can hit the subscribe button. If money can be made remaking, remastering, or rebooting an old IP, the order is given. Games that aren't yet worthy of such a treatment aren't left out either. Some are ported to other platforms for the first time, some are given minor performance and graphical boosts, and even the few that don't fit into any of these categories can always get the backwards compatibility treatment. Regardless of the console generation, genre, or even developer, if a game has merely existed in the last 25 years, then chances are modern gaming has found a way to make it relevant again. Besides one game, a game that has never been remastered, remade, rebooted, ported, or even made backwards compatible on modern hardware. A game that sat in the corner, crying itself to sleep while its brothers got showered with modern love. This is the story of the game that time forgot, Turok Evolution. But the real question is why? For a game to be forgotten to the degree that Turok Evolution has been forgotten, it must just not be very fun, right? Absolutely not. In the 20 years that I've, over 20 years now in fact, that I've been playing this game, Existential Crisis, off the screen, <laughs> I have never once gotten tired or bored of it. The enemy design, variety, and gore are incredible, and at the heart of all of it is a fantastic weapon sandbox. Now, this might sound extreme, right, but just hear me out. There's a reason that I'm talking about the weapon sandbox of this game before literally anything else. I honestly think that Turok Evolution's weapon sandbox rivals that of Doom, Quake, and Halo. It was very much a sandbox of its era. Late 90s and early 2000s FPSs had the scales weighted far more in favour of fun over balance, geared at providing as many unique and creative ways of killing as possible, and boy was Turok Evolution no outlier. This game has a lot of weapons, and each weapon has at least one alt fire mode that radically changes the way that it works, and the way that all of this kind of plays in with the game's incredible gore system is immaculate. The legs, arms, and heads of enemies can all be removed individually based on where and how they're attacked, with fountains of blood spurting from the cavities. So when you kill an enemy in this game, you really kill that enemy. It's clear that as much thought and effort was put into the ways that enemies die in this game as the tools used to make them die. The enemy variety is great as well, both in the enemy faction, the Sleg Troopers, and also the prehistoric wildlife that Turok is known so well for. There are so many different kinds of things that you'll be slaughtering in this game. And the weapon sandbox could not be any better suited for this slaughter. The war club is your default weapon. It's a bladed club that can be swung fast or charged up for a heavy swing. Both excellent at slicing off limbs. You have two bows in this game, the regular bow, and then the tech bow, which has a scope. They come with three types of arrows, regular arrows, explosive arrows, and poison arrows that make your enemy fatally sick and cause them to vomit up their insides before keeling over and dying. The pistol isn't quite your basic pistol, just like another game. The base model must be firing like 50 A flechette rounds or something because it fires fast and it shreds through enemies, but its alt fire mode transforms it into a sniper and as you can see, this thing shreds as well. The grenade is an impact grenade, but just like the weapons, even the grenades in this game have alt fire modes. The grenade rearranges itself to reveal spikes, which allow it to be stuck to enemies or surfaces. The shotgun in this game is one of my favourites. It's a regular old pump action shotgun, but when you find the quad barrel upgrade and unlock its alt fire, you can pump it up to four times, which chambers up to four shells, which are all shot at once for a devastating effect on both the enemy's limbs and also the game's frame rate. The subscribe button is a really cool thing that 59.6% of you somehow haven't hit. If you hit it, its regular function is getting me closer to my 2023 goal of 1 million subscribers, but its alt fire mode is even cooler. It's activated by hitting this bell here and what happens is you get notified whenever I release a video just like this one, so go on, you know you want to hit it. The rocket launcher in this game is just... It's, insane. Its default firing mode fires one massive rocket with three mini rockets that surround it, all doing individual damage, 
And then its first alt fire mode is the iconic to Turok Cerebral Boar, or Swarm Boar, as it's known in Turok Evolution, which fires five boars that drill into each limb and tear them off one by one with insane visuals and sound design to boot. And then its second alt fire mode is just ridiculous. It's a literal nuke that kills every single ally and enemy in the area and is only available at one point in the entire game. The flechette gun is really cool. Its standard mode of fire is suppressed, and it fires razor-sharp flechettes that not only shred through flesh, but are the only projectile that can be fired underwater. In its alt fire mode, well, the gun opens up and turns into a handheld minigun, perfect for tearing through the limbs and triggering the YouTube demonetization bot. The spider mine is a James Bond-esque gadget. You throw down a robotic spider that you can control to scout out an area and either remotely play a distracting sound, explode, or emit toxic gas. The dark matter cube is a strange little grenade. Its standard mode emits a massive explosion zone that insta-kills anything that comes in contact with it. And once the cube has rearranged itself to activate its alt fire, it acts like a black hole, sucking in and stretching any hostiles until they burst. The flamethrower may be my favourite video game flamethrower of all time. Its standard mode functions like any flamethrower, except, unlike usual, it is extremely effective. And then its alt fire mode fires three balls of sticky napalm, instantly igniting enemies and the ground alike. The Gravity Disruptor emits a shockwave that knocks back everything around you, but its alt fire mode is its cool factor. You can pick up an enemy and bash them into walls, into objects, and even into other enemies, knocking them over and even pushing them off a map, whilst also knocking their limbs off. You can even give yourself a blood shower with what's left over once you've done some good bashing. And then finally, the Plasma Cannon fires... Plasma, you guessed it, and its alt fire modes are activated by inserting one of two extra lenses. So firstly, the Seeker lens locks the cannon onto enemies' heads, making every shot land precisely on target regardless of where you're aiming. And then the Chain lens turns the plasma into static energy that stuns the target and then chain reacts to anyone else nearby. You just don't get weapon sandboxes as varied as this nowadays. The way that these weapons play into the enemy AI, their gore and level design, is easily Turok Evolution's strongest element. It's the main thing that keeps me coming back to this game after two long decades. There are no games out there that let you break the Geneva Convention as many times as Turok Evolution. Now, my favourite games of all time are no strangers to rough development cycles. I mean, Resident Evil 4 was rebooted so many times that it led to the creation of Devil May Cry, and Halo 2 quite literally broke up marriages. And Turok Evolution is no stranger to this. This game was being made right as its development studio was beginning to die. It was made by the Austin, Texas branch of Acclaim, who were a massive publisher in the 90s, and who in 2004 filed for Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Now, Acclaim were an interesting publisher who were known for like a wide variety of games and also a wide variety of controversies, including, but not limited to, trying to buy advertising space on tombstones, offering to reimburse drivers in the UK for getting speeding tickets to market Burnout 2, and offering $10,000 to any UK parents who would name their newborn child Turok. Dude. The Y2K era of gaming was just an entirely different beast. Honestly, it's a miracle that Turok Evolution ever even shipped in the first place, let alone it's as fun as it actually is, but let me tell you, this game is extremely unpolished, which can be annoying at times, but it can also be, frankly, fucking hilarious at times. But nothing suffered from this game's development like its story. Now, I've played this game probably 30 plus times at this point, over two decades, right? And I'm gonna be real honest with you guys right now. I don't have a fucking clue what this game's story is at all. It's clear that most development effort was put into the combat and the gore, which was definitely the right choice. And I think the environment design and the art direction do a really good job at world building, but the story absolutely doesn't. The long and short of the story is that it's a prequel to all the other Turok games. You play as Talset, a Native American who's fighting his cowboy nemesis, Tobias Bruckner, on Earth, but before he can deal the killing blow, the two are randomly sucked into a portal and taken to another realm. 
Yes, that's the kind of story we're dealing with. The two find themselves separated from one another in a different reality, a place called the Lost Lands. Talset is healed by the River Village, aka the good guys, and their seer, this guy named Tarkeen, tells Talset that it's his destiny to accept the mantle of Turok and free him from a curse. To be a Turok basically makes you protector of the earth, pretty much. Talset initially denies the title and heads back into the jungle to fight the reptilian warrior species known as the Sleg, who have invaded the jungle, attacked the river village, and taken its villagers prisoner. Now, the Sleg are led by this dude, Lord Tyrannus, but <laughs> more on this guy later. Like all incredibly deep and thought out villains, the Sleg's ultimate goal is to enslave or wipe out humanity. How incredibly original. After sneaking into a Sleg base and rescuing prisoners, including the River Village's leader, Wise Father, Talset is, conf <laughs> Tal is confronted by a large army of Sleg troopers as he escapes, and would you look at who happens to be leading them? Well, if it ain't old Tobias Bruckner himself. This ain't a sight sore eye. Bruckner. Hello, savage. After getting to safety, the Allies discover that the Sleg's final plan is to assault the capital city of the Lost Lands, Galliana. But to get to Galliana, they have to cross the Great Chasm, which is exactly what it sounds like. And bridging this chasm is the Suspended City, which is actually a really cool idea. So, Talset goes to the Suspended City to repel Tyrannus' assault and save the Senators, who ultimately decide that the city is lost, and so the only course of action is to destroy it sending it crashing down to the bottom of the chasm and preventing the Sleg from using it as a bridge to cross the chasm and reach Galliana. But then Tyrannus has one more thing up his sleeve. He unleashes the Juggernaut, a giant mechanized war dinosaur to assault and destroy Galliana. So I guess crossing the chasm didn't really matter then? Talset infiltrates the Juggernaut and destroys it from within during which he finally faces off with Lord Tyrannus in what is possibly the most fucking hilarious cutscene in any video game of all time, unintentionally, may I add. This dude is the leader of the enemies that you spent the entire game fighting, and when you finally face him off, I mean, words don't do this, ju just, just watch. You will pay for your heresy with blood! And he's gone, just like that. With the Sleg defeated, Talset hunts down Bruckner. The two face off in a canyon, with Bruckner riding an armoured, weaponised T-Rex, and after what can only be described as one of the battles of all time, Talset brings the T-Rex down on Bruckner and walks away as raptors eat him alive. The game then ends with Tyrannus elsewhere, wallowing in defeat in some cool gothic tower, as Talset formally takes on the title of Turok becoming the Son of Stone, the Protector of Earth. Honestly, a pretty badass final cutscene. And that's it, that's the story. The main issue with this story isn't the story itself per se, but rather its implementation, which sounds quite insane, but just hear me out right. You'll go from one mission to the next, you'll be in a completely new area with completely new random objectives, and you'll have no idea why you're there or even how you got there, it honestly just feels like they forgot to add cutscenes to half of this game. And speaking of cutscenes, the pre-rendered cutscenes in this game, at least the bookend ones, are actually pretty good, but the in-game ones are like, just laughably bad to be honest. I mean, the voice acting isn't great, the sound quality is absolutely terrible. That soft skin General Bruckner let them get through into the jungle! Why the hell does Tyrannus want a human general? It's an insult! The animations are glitchy as hell, and very little story is conveyed through them at all. 99% of them just consist of Telset standing there like this, trying to look menacing. And as for the antagonists? Well, Tyrannus just fucking runs away, so he didn't matter at all. And Tobias Bruckner was so bad so bad that EGM Magazine created an entire annual award ceremony in his honour to name the absolute worst of video games of the year, with multiple categories, may I add, and the award ceremony is titled the Tobias Bruckner Memorial Awards. He was such a bad villain, he spawned a bad award ceremony. But believe it or not, regardless of all of that, Acclaim had at one point planned to make a sequel to this game. 
which sadly went down with their ship. Only a few pieces of concept art and about 11 seconds of cutscene footage from it are available online and sadly I don't think we're ever going to see any of this come to fruition. What have come to fruition though are the official Hidden Xperia PCs, created in partnership with Apex Gaming PCs. Your boy now has his very own line of PCs, ranging from the lower end pure form build to the higher end Gravemind and Primordial builds. There's a monster machine here fit for any of your needs, and if you use my code HIDDEN at checkout, you can get up to 250 buckaroos off your PC. So we've established that the story was a... Uh shit shall we say <laughs> we're all going to die oh, God. Fire. God. Of a but was the overall campaign bad as well absolutely fucking not the story may take l's at every turn but the world building led by genuinely amazing art direction and soundtrack set pieces and scenarios are honestly really good and thanks to the game's level design enemy design and Frankly, ahead of its time gore system, it's really fun to play and replay, even if the connective tissue between the scenarios just isn't there. The jungles that you fight through early on feel believable, densely packed with flora and fauna, with wildlife both hostile and docile scattered throughout, hiding in the bushes. The slag bases that you infiltrate and fight through have this kind of ancient sandstone temple look to them. And the suspended city has that ever iconic Y2K era futuristic industrial sci-fi look that I always talk about. Lots of deep ambers, ominous oranges and reds cut in by the neon blue accents and lights of the structures. Turok Evolution's art direction is honestly as strong as its weapon sandbox and the way that it helps to present this game's world really makes up for how bad the story is. It makes sure that the world of the Lost Lands isn't completely wasted by the lack of narrative. The same can be said for the Slag as well. They have literally no backstory or fleshing out as a faction whatsoever, but their fantastic and wildly varying designs and almost stereotypical bad guy voices give them enough presence to feel imposing. Those infidels don't stand a chance against us. No one can defeat Tyrannus. We'll overrun these pink insects and be feasting on them for years. Yeah, well, I don't take orders from humans. I mean, seriously, I would love to see a modern recreation of these designs. I guarantee all the Slag Troopers would look so, so damn good with modern graphical fidelity. And then to tie it all together, there's the soundtrack, which honestly, I would go as far as saying is probably the most underrated video game soundtrack of all time. Nelson Everhart did an amazing job crafting a soundtrack that varied an insane amount from location to location. This soundtrack has like Surge Tankian Freddie Mercury levels of range, from its bombastic epic tracks to its quieter, more subtle background tracks. The range is insane to be honest with you, and it perfectly complements the art direction and gameplay. So the game looks great and it sounds great, but how does it play? Well, considering this game released after Halo 1, which radically changed the way that console FPSs were made and played, it feels very much like a pre-Halo 1 game. The movement, the encounter design, the ammo and the medkit drops on the ground, the lack of weapon limit, the controls, they all exude that style of design that kind of just vanished after Bungie revolutionized the industry in 2001. As does its level structure, but not exactly in a great way. So this game's campaign is split up into 15 chapters, each containing a number of levels that are separated by a loading screen. A long, long loading screen. Now this kind of structure seems fine, right? But there's, there's one major issue. The levels don't have checkpoints and they can vary massively in length. Some are so short that they're over in under a minute. Others can take 20 plus minutes and their difficulties vary massively as well. This game can never quite seem to get its difficulty balancing right. It's either far too easy or just annoyingly difficult and the annoyingly difficult levels just so happen to be the longer ones most of the time. Getting right to the end of a 20 minute long mission on low health, unable to find a medkit, only to die from an enemy that you couldn't even see and be sent right back to the start, isn't exactly fun. That said though, although the level design is by no means Halo Combat Evolved or Prey 2017 levels of good, it's 
definitely enjoyable, the early jungle levels in particular are. Climbing over the mountain to get to the Sleg base is really, really cool because instead of just progressing like forward in a, a straight line, you instead progress vertically, you go up. So you can see if you look up or down other parts of the level, which I don't know, I always used to find that pretty cool. Where this game's levels shine though, are in their set pieces. First encountering a T-Rex as it turns the target you and luring it into the enemy at the dam. Fighting an armored stegosaurus with missile pods, a triceratops with cannons, or a T-Rex decked out with flamethrowers, rockets, and a 50 PMG. Climbing a skyscraper tall monument to the god of law and stuff like that, this game has a great way of raising the stakes and piling on the tension in spite of how lackluster the story is. Seriously, the city levels in particular are a great example of theming and presentation picking up where the story falters. They feel like an epic desperate fight that I actually care about the stakes and consequences of, despite not giving a single shit about the story or the stakes that it tries to raise. The way the art direction, soundtrack and encounter design all come together manages to get my blood pumping and it immerses me in a world that, by all accounts, I've been given no reason to care about. This game also attempts stealth as well. Attempts. Now, I am a huge fan of stealth games. Metal Gear Solid is my tied second favorite franchise of all time. I love, love the first Splinter Cell. And whenever a game offers me a stealth section, I will always stealth it. To me, going loud in a stealth section of a game is akin to committing heresy in the 16th century, right? You just don't do it. But Turok Evolution is the outlier for me. The game's combat and weapon sandbox are frankly just too fun to take levels quietly and methodically. It's so much more enjoyable to just go loud, go guns blazing, and just stop blowing limbs off. But what isn't as fun are this game's objectives. Now, I'm almost adamant that this is because of how rocky the game's development was, but most objectives in the levels range from like uninteresting rule of three fetch quest kind of things to just poorly, or in some cases, completely untelegraphed objectives, like switches and buttons that you have to hit that the game doesn't even inform you exist. And in the essence of annoying, unfun design, we have to talk about the flying missions. Yes, this game is not just a first-person shooter. There are also a handful of levels where you're flying a pterodactyl with a 50 cal machine gun and missiles, which on paper sounds pretty cool, right? Well, uh, not so much. The difficulty of these is, again, all over the place, but what's worse is the hitbox of both your bird and the environment just aren't telegraphed properly. You can fly through a gap that looks plenty big enough and your bird will just splatter into a million pieces and it's right back to the start for you. I used to hate these levels as a kid, like so much so that I'd just go and put the all levels cheat on and just skip them out because I didn't want to play them. And it turns out that I wasn't the only one. These levels got absolutely torn to shreds when this game released. But now that I'm older and, you know, my brain is actually developed now, I don't find them as awful as I used to. Like, I can play them now. I don't enjoy them per se, but they're more playable than when I was younger. The issue is they're just not as fun as the regular gameplay and they take up mission space that could have been better filled with more of this game's absolute strongest ingredient. Sandbox driven slag genocide. Now, Turok Evolution may have released before Xbox Live, but this was the couch co op era, goddammit. Split screen local multiplayer was a must. And man, did they knock it out of the park with this game. As is the trend with this game, fun was massively prioritized over balance. This game was never going to be an eSport. It was never going to be the console version of Counter-Strike 1.6. Instead, it was designed as a fun party shooter that you play with three friends all sat on the same sofa over a couple beers. Or in my case, because I was about seven years old when this game came out, on the sofa with a can of coke and some turkey dinosaurs. And god damn does this game excel at doing that. I really feel like I took for granted how fun these multiplayer maps were when I was younger. You just don't see anything like them nowadays. They're just far too creative. Not only are the layouts varied, but each map has a gimmick that's unique to that map. For example, this map is mostly tree houses and rope bridges, with a dense forest floor below where the rocket launcher spawns. But that forest floor is teeming with AI raptors, so it's a risk going down to get it. 
or this map, where you can activate a switch to drop spike traps on your enemies, or this boarding action-esque map with literal trampolines in the middle. This is the kind of map design that the modern gaming industry is missing out on. The multiplayer also comes with loads of custom games, tons of settings that you can change, and so many characters from the campaign that you can play as, which I loved. You can play as Talset, Bruckner, the suspended city marines, almost every kind of sled trooper, captain, commander, and character in the game, and even goddamn raptors. Me and my friends used to play split screen multiplayer on this back in the day, almost as much as Halo 1. It was such a good party FPS, and it's one of the reasons that I miss the Y2K era of gaming so much. And it's at this point in the video where I do a little bit of begging. There are no modern means of playing this game at all. Its PC version looks and plays like shit. The PS2 version looks and runs like shit. The Xbox version looks good, but runs like shit. The GameCube version, which I played in this video via emulation, looks decent, runs well, but sounds like shit. There is no optimal method of playing this game. And so I plead, plead, with Night Dive Studios, the current owners of the Turok IP, and the ones who already remastered the first two Turok games, please, I beg of you, create a stable port of this game for PC at least. I'm not asking for a Resident Evil style remake or a Halo 2 anniversary style remaster of this game. I'm literally just asking for a version of this game that runs on modern hardware, that doesn't have a 30 FPS cap, that doesn't have screwed up graphics, that doesn't have garbage controls, and that doesn't have awfully compressed audio. Please. I'm also going to beg all of you guys to leave your thoughts on Turok Evolution down below in the comments. Did you play this game when you were younger? Has this video inspired you to go back and replay it? Or hell, play it for the first time? Let me hear it down in the comments, friendos. And with that said, I want to give a major thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the continued support over there, as per usual. Thank you all very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't done so already. would really appreciate it. And with that said, I'll catch you all in the next one.